speech and education and things like that. So <clears throat> if you see the, the vista here, this is a typical scene of our limestone barrens. And unfortunately, I haven't been to the Burren and I'm really excited to try and get there someday, but you can see that it looks apparently quite similar. And it will take a few seconds for the, the, the screen, the, the slides to go, so I apologize again. Hopefully the next one's up. So I want to acknowledge, you know, after 20 years of working with um, the communities, I want to say uh, really um, a hearty shout out to all the students and communities and schools that have supported our work on the Limestone Barrens. They've been awesome. And the other part of the equation is the recovery team. So we have this recovery team that I'll talk more about that has really supported our work. We have academic collaborators. And of course, we have lots of funders because as you know, you can't do this sort of work without um, good financial support also. So hopefully there's a, a map of uh, North America on the screen now. Um, I've boxed in the island of Newfoundland. So we're an, a large island basically hanging off into the North Atlantic on the east coast of Canada. What I wanted to emphasize is that if you look at this um, squiggly line I've drawn here, which is supposed to be the Gulf Stream, that's where all that nice warm air is circulated not to Newfoundland, but off to you guys. So what we do, unfortunately, is we get the cold waters flowing down from the La uh, Labrador Sea, which will actually surround most of the island with ice in the winter and spring. Um, I shouldn't say it's a bad thing because of course that's why we have the wonderful cod fishery because we have such uh, rich oceans. So keep that in mind that this is the Strait of Belle Isle between the island of Newfoundland and Labrador and in the spring it is packed with ice. Okay, it's, Newfoundland is not only a biodiversity hotspot but it's also a geological hotspot and it's really interesting because Newfoundland is, a, I call it a dog's breakfast of geology, because we actually have part of it, the eastern part of the island is actually from the Moroccan plate that drifted across and hit part of the Appalachian um, plate from the, that came up from the south. And so you get this incredible diversity of different types of, um, of uh, substrates. What I want to show you, though, is that the blue is the limestone, and that is prevalently on the west coast of the island. And so this is called the Great Northern Peninsula. And we just kind of break it up into the northern limestone barrens and the southern limestone barrens. I'm going to talk mostly about the northern limestone barrens because that's where we've done most of our work. So if we zoom in, on the Labrador, on the uh, North, Great Northern Peninsula, you can see that although this yellow area in orange is all limestone, it is covered with forest. The only thing that is limestone barrens is this tiny little bit of red you see hugging the coast. And that is what we call limestone barrens. It's very rare. It's less than 1% of the island, and it's actually only 50 square kilometers. So it's very small. It's actually 0.3% of the island's land mass. It has many different types of limestone. And you'll notice what's interesting is that there's actually marine sediment. So how did that happen? This is uh, just a little clip from a very delightful book called The Geology of Newfoundland. And what this tells us is this red, which is the limestone, actually came through this very warm Iapetus ocean. Warm, think of it, it was like Jamaica. And it therefore deposited these beautiful marine sediments. And that's why you can find all kinds of interesting fossils. So if we want to look more closely at some of the beautiful types of limestone that we see, you get all kinds of gravel limestones, you get these beautiful grikes, and you get these big blocks. It looks like someone was playing dice or something on the landscape. And I gather this is 
similar to what you see in the bureau. You also have these big boulders that are just strewn across the landscape. But I want to point out these two interesting ones where, and I'm not sure you would have this because this is to do with the fact that we have such in the Northern Peninsula cold springs and winters. And what happens is you get something called freeze thaw, which I'll explain a little bit more in a minute, but it actually ends up, you have these really interesting stone stripes they're called because of the movement of the soil. And the other very interesting um, uh, type of freeze thaw we get are these frost boils. And frost boils are usually found in the Arctic, okay? So this again um, shows us that we're in quite a cold climate compared to what your limestone would be like. I'd also like to thank Michael Brzezinski for the use of his photos. You'll see him again in a minute. <clears throat> I want to give a shout out to Michael and his uh, colleagues for this beautiful book that they produced of several years ago called Exploring the Limestone Barrens. It is a, um, available online. It's really beautiful. It has all color photographs. It has 300 species of insects, birds, plants, talks about fossils, and it, of course, talks about rare species in conservation. So it's really an excellent um, um, reference. So I've kind of given you an idea that we have this cold climate. And indeed, many of the plants that we see are actually Arctic alpine. Now, we can't call them Arctic alpine because we're not in the Arctic, nor are we on the um, alpine because we're actually at sea level. But you can see plants like moss campion, bluebells, some of the gentians, some of the saxifrages. And these are things that I see all the time up in the Arctic where I do the rest of my research. So it's really a great place to come and see interesting plants that you didn't usually see. So limestone plants are absolutely beautiful. They're quite diminutive in many cases. My favorite is the velvet bells. There's rhodiola, there's all kinds of different caryophyllaceae. So we have many, many rare plants on the limestone barrens. Almost half of what we call rare plants um, on the island are found there. And that's why we call it a hot spot of biodiversity. It's also incredibly beautiful. I want to step back for a minute and just talk about some of the uh, species that I'll, um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll going to elaborate on. So two of these are brea species, Long's brea and Fernald's brea, uh, named after um, their finders, and, and they're both endangered. And the Baron's willow, which is also endangered. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact these are endemic species, which is really interesting because that's found, that means they're found nowhere else on earth. So these are very, very interesting plants that um, really can only be seen if you come to the Northern Peninsula. I just want to show this. This is Henry Mann, uh, one of the recovery team's early members, and he's actually looking at a brea to try and distinguish them because they are quite hard to distinguish in the field. And there are actually hybrids that we found, but I'm not going to talk about those today. But this is what you have to do when you want to study these plants. Okay, so we've already said that these Plants are found nowhere else on earth, but I want to show you one of the reasons of their endangerment is because of their very restricted distributions. So if you look right up at the top of the northern peninsula in this pink square, that is the sole. This longer oval here is um, Fernald's brea. And there is actually a tiny little population here that someone found not many years ago. But I would draw your attention to the red oval, which is Long's Brea. And that is where it's found in the world. It's like 10 linear uh, kilometers of where this is found only in the world. So it's pretty, pretty uh, interesting. And we have lots of tourists from all over the world coming to see these, maybe not the showiest plants in the world, but quite important with for biodiversity. So under our federal and provincial legislation, um, we have to um, develop a team is tasked with 
doing. We have to basically tell the minister, advise the minister, how do we actually manage these species? So I'm just going to talk about briefly about the Limestone Barrens Recovery Plan. We are super happy about this. It just came out. Um, as I said, it's mandated under the legislation. The recovery team has been working on this for 10 years. It's big, it's multi-species. I'm only going to talk about two or three species, but there are actually 10 species listed in the recovery plan. Most we don't know much about and it's over 100 pages long. So you can imagine it was like tearing out your hair. But what's important is that it uh, outlines the conservation efforts that we need to do to make sure that these plants persist on the landscape, right? So we want to address threats. And we're happy that that's been submitted to the minister, the minister in charge for review, and we hope that uh, they will soon give us the okay so that we can um, uh, continue to work on these plants. So just to give you a sense of what it looks like in the winter, um, remember I said the Strait of Belle Isle is usually filled with ice and it has wicked winds. Bumblebees, they hear in the summer don't fly, they crawl because the wind's so bad. But you can see one of the things that happens is the snow is actually blown off of the barrens. And that has some very important implications because it doesn't have the um, protection of the snow. The snow actually acts as a blanket. So what happens is you get this very interesting um, uh, phenomenon called needle ice. And what that means is that you get freeze thaw, freeze thaw, and what happens is that moves this very fine limestone uh, substrate so that you actually get these very interesting uh, things that I showed you before, the frost sorting of the limestone gravels that you see in the lower here. You can see how all the bigger ones have been kind of uh, pushed off to the side. And then these really cool frost boils. Okay, and they're just like that. It's good frost. It's like a boil and it's very fine in the middle. Now, this is very important because a lot of the plants will tend to find or be uh, found around the outside of these frost boils because, of course, it's not moving as much. I'm going to show you just one graph and it's very easy. Don't look at any detail. This is just January to December every month over four years. And what this is, is the number of freeze thaw events per month. Okay, so what we do is we have data loggers in the soil. And when the soil goes below zero, we know that it's having a freeze thaw event. Okay, and so this shows you that in you get lots of freeze thaw in the shoulder seasons of March, April and May. And again, in the fall. Now, this is before we started the experiment, so there's no data. And unfortunately, we were not able to get the data in 2020. So you can see that it has some very important implications about how the plants can persist. And what's important is without this freeze thaw action, these rare, small, tiny little plants couldn't persist because um, the, the woody, um, uh, woody shrubs like uh, mountain avens and some of the junipers would just grow over them, okay? So it's very important. This is what's called a natural disturbance regime, just on a tiny, tiny scale. So as we know, um, quarrying is an important uh, economic um, engine in limestone barrens areas because it's very, very valuable. And so what's happened in the past before we knew the plants were there is that there's been a lot of habitat loss and degradation through this quarrying. So what we did is we, uh, um, because Longsbrea is so rare, we had to think about how we can have the best chances of it persisting into the future. So we started this restoration project and the objective was to restore the natural biodiversity, remember all those rare species, plus the hydrology and the soil processes that had been stopped by the quarry, okay? And to our knowledge, it's not been done in these very um, rare uh, gravel quarries. So what did we do? The first thing we did is we had to go in before the, the um, 
before the big um, equipment came in, because what happens is when they're about to quarry, they push off all of the vegetation that's there and they put it into these mounds called overburden and they're very high in nutrients. It's like a giant compost pile. This is not what the limestone barrens plants like. They can't even grow on it. So what happened here, and there's Michael Brzezinski right there, they take out any of limestone plants that had colonized, the brea had not, and they, they take them out so we can replant them. So that's the first thing. Then we had the big equipment came out and it took a long time to remove this overburden because basically it just attracts non-native plants that like that high nitrogen. Then what we did is they reconstructed these beach terraces. Remember we said these from the old Iapetus ocean, you have these beautiful limestone um, marine uh, terraces. And so we tried to sculpt it back to what it looked like before based on aerial photographs. We then replanted a bunch of different uh, limestone barren species. What you see us planting here is Brea. Brea has tiny seeds and what happened is you can see just how small they are because that's a toothpick. And these are tiny, tiny Brea along the eye seeds. So the question is, how well are we doing? So as of 2020, thanks to Dulce, <laughs> who went out there and, and did all this, of the 880 seeds that we planted in this little replanting scheme, we still have 110. And that's awesome because usually Brea 10% survival over a few years. So we're doing really well. And we have, as I showed you with that little freeze thaw graph, we've started to reinstate the freeze thaw cycle. So it's looking good so far, but it's only been a three and a half years. So we have to continue to monitor. All right, so that's the end of the, the habitat loss section. Oh, I should, sorry, I forgot. So we do have, just show you again, this is June. June. That's how cold it is in June. And they're actually planting what we call um, uh, limestone, uh, I'm sorry, um, vegetation islands. So this is where they had taken those original larger plants. And then what we do is we put them into um, these uh, little islands because these are called nucleation sites because the other plant seeds will stop there and you'll start to grow um, a limestone barrens. Now, because some of these were quite large when we had to transplant them, they didn't all survive. So there's variable survival. Okay, so What's interesting is when you think about limestone, you think, yes, quarries and all that. You don't think about pests and pathogens, but we do have a big problem in terms of a threat for Brea longii and Brea fernaldii. We have, um, we have a tiny diamondback moth larvae, which in, infects, infests both Long's Brea and Fernald's Brea. And here you can see the adult, it's very tiny. If you try to grow cabbage or anything like that, you know these little guys, they're worldwide pests of cruciferous plants. Here you can see one of the instars, the larval instars eating the um, um, leaves, but they also will go and eat the inside of the flowers. Okay, so obviously there's not gonna be any seeds there. The other thing that we have problems with are fungal pathogens. And there are many different types. Some of you may you know, know some of these and it infests, infects both Long's and Fernald's brea. And why this is so serious is because it causes seed loss and mortality. You can actually see a dead brea longii plant right next to a brea fernaldii. So what are we doing about this? It's not easy. There's no one solution like going back and doing restoration. Here you can see Dulcie and Jeff, our summer student tracking infestations. Um, on, and then you can see another student putting up these targeted pheromone traps that actually catch the males to try and stop them from reproducing because they lay their eggs on the limestone barrens. So this is an ongoing task and we don't have an, into, an, an easy answer for that. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is just the problem we have with some invasive weeds. And um, you can see here when the uh, heavy machinery, these are all non-native plants there. You can see they're very vigorous and green. 
Um, when we take, took away most of the overburden, we found not only just the, the plant remains, but also a lot of dumping of old stuff. So it had to be taken off site. But you can see there's still some remnant um, plants there. And here on the lower left, you can see some of us actually trying to uh, take out some of the dandelion, non-native dandelions. Um, uh, before they go to seed. We also have problems with colt's foot, which is of course a, a European uh, import. So um, we will continue to remove invasive weeds. We try not to use any pesticides, um, but we may have to try this. So thanks, that's the end for my part. And I look forward to any of your questions. Okay, and I'm gonna turn it over to Dulcie and you can see our, our cold, cold group here. Hi, everyone. I'm not sure what's happening, but I'm trying to get my back to the first slide. Here we go. Great. Um, I just want to share with you a little background of how citizens here on the Great Northern Peninsula became aware of these endemic species and their fragile habitat and what's been happening uh, in recovery efforts. So um, from the very start, long before people knew here on the peninsula that there was something special and rare here on these barrens, science and stewardship were in partnership, I'd like to, I'd like to say. And uh, I wanna share a little bit about that. And as you can see, um, looking from a distance, the barrens appear to be relatively that, but the closer you get to the ground, the more you see that they're teeming with life from various, uh, plants to insects and um, it was quite a challenge to bring this to the forefront for local people. So our stewardship tale begins with a discovery a long time ago um, and as I said the science and stewardship go hand in hand for the limestone barrens and according to um, Fernald's dear, very detailed um, accounts that he recorded in his journals, he had a lot of interaction with local people and that started a building of relationships that uh, provided him with uh, the opportunity to go to inaccessible places because of the guidance of local guides. And um, first when I started the Limestone Barons program, there was one individual who shared that information with me because of a family member from years back had um, passed, up, passed it along. However, relatively speaking, nobody on the Northern Peninsula knew about these limestone barrens. So um, fast forward to uh, the 1990s, um, researchers from Memorial University came to the peninsula and started to do surveys and Louise being one of them. Um, and it was about this time that local people started to ask questions and when um, the researchers were out on the barrens they were they would come alongside and ask questions and of course they were informed um, of what was happening here and became aware of the specialness of this unique and fragile ecosystem. I believe that the key is to build the necessary conservation ethic, and this is all a part of that. Engage locals from the start in any way that's possible and keep them involved because they are the keepers of the gate. Here, 
uh, is one of the main reasons that recovery um, started for a recovery plan was drafted for the limestone barrens. There had been quite a decline in Brea um, populations. And as the fines were put forward to federal and provincial governments by um, local researchers, a, a, a team was struck, a recovery team who put in action a uh, development of a recovery plan. And within that plan, uh, stewardship was identified as one of the key strategies. So since that time, we have been addressing um, ATV issues, other off-road vehicle issues, and most re uh, more um, recently, the ecotourism footprint, although it is something that we have been dealing with all along, uh, it seems to have an increase as we are in more of a global community. And currently we're working with ecotourism groups, local citizens, government agencies, and scientists. And mitigation, of course, will continue to um, include and engage local citizens and partners as outlined within our recovery plans and priorities given to uh, these actions. And ongoing educational activities in local communities and schools are vital to on the ground recovery actions. Growing season on the peninsula is sure. So when we started to um, raise awareness of the limestone barrens, um, species at risk and their fragile ecosystem, we were challenged in how do you um, get messages out to people about these beautiful plants when the growing season is so short. Well, we found a way to do it um, through photography. And because we had a good relationship with the local media already, uh, I had actually been working as a local photographer and reporter prior to starting this program. So we, we were quick to see how we had to be creative and, and how we would get our messages out. As I know that it's very challenging to try and win support when, when you can't show something to people that you're talking about. So, um, hence we went out and we got as many photos as we could. And this is how we started to um, get the awareness out, going into schools, engaging uh, local students and staff at the schools and the question always came up, well, why are we just hearing about this? And um, of course, somewhere in the channels of time from Fernell to the late nineties, um, this important um, ecosystem had kind of gotten shelved. These plants uh, weren't brought onto the forefront until this recovery, recovery team was struck in the late nineties. Um, thankfully, we did have bridges built, and because of my work with, uh, with the uh, newspaper, I had already uh, relations built with the schools, so it was easy to get in and to get some presentations done. Uh, we actually were able to bring in the science, and you can see here um, some of the researchers from MON. So people were so happy and excited uh, and I say people, but I mean the local school staff, because they were now able to take their students out to the backyard, because some of these uh, sites are literally in the backyard of our local people, uh, local citizens. So they were able to take them out and um, do field trips without having to travel three to four hours to get to a site. Some of the ways that other ways that we've um, been able to get our messages out, we um, actually started a Limestone Barrens Youth Ambassador Program, considering that these students, um, many of them are high end users of the Barrens. 
range, ranging in um, the early teens. So they uh, became advocates for the cause and at public um, meetings, whatever was happening within the communities, they would go set up displays and um, distribute information about the limestone barrens. Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro, a corporate sponsor for more than 10 years, also provided uh, a great venue for us to get out and to um, share the messages. And here we have, um, it, it was unbelievable the way that we were able to get creative and bring out some uh, messages of limestone barons. Here we had the students came up or the green team, the four, the team members of four came up with an idea to host a limestone barons pageant. Well, at first it just seemed like one of those ridiculous ideas. However, uh, I went along with it and, and it turned out to be a great venue. We actually had fishermen and other users of the Barrens come out and, and take part in this um, pageant, their, their families. What we have here is someone, a lady from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, a uh, health nurse from the local a community hospital and a Parks Canada person. So they sat as a um, panel and asked questions which the participants in the um, pageant had to answer relating to the limestone barons. So we actually got people out that we would have never got out in any other way, shape or form. And that was fantastic. So many times that we've had uh, opportunities to use our youth to draw out our primary users. So um, I would encourage anybody who's doing recovery um, and reaching out to towns and communities, not to forget the secondary users because they are the ones who can actually influence the primary users often. Uh, as a result of the, her involvement with um, the Limestone Bears Green Teens, this uh, young girl here actually won a scholarship because of her involvement. Uh, we've been working with all levels of society. Um, here we have a ladies group who actually uh, took the flora and put on quilt blocks and made quilts out of it. Again, it was another way that we were able to share um, our messages. Following um, awareness within a community, we, we have uh, here a lady who was actually sharing at a come home year celebration, her experience about the limestone barons. And young and old, we've been involved everyone that we possibly could. So here we have a lady who's in her 90s, who's actually doing embroidery off limestone barons for her. Early, uh, early on in implementation of the program, a limestone barons community working group was struck and with the purpose to assist uh, the limestone barons program with protection of limestone of its uh, species at risk and its habitat and to advance economic benefits for their community in a manner that would be um, sustainable. We produced with the, with the images that we had and the support team that we have, which is a great one. We were actually able to produce several um, resource materials from brochures to posters, a Limestone Barons activity book, which actually outlined uh, our story from Fernell to um, current status, including uh, stewardship signs. We developed posters, banners with limestone barons, flora, and um, habitat images as well. Limestone barons placemats, and I'm just going to give you a moment just to take uh, a look at them.
the re the community working group that was struck actually um, provided assistance in a lot of ways when we were a lot of different activities out in the community. So including dissemination of critical habitat mats. And we also work with other partners who provided uh, assistance as well. We have provided um, support for the Wilderness Ecological Res Reserve Advisory Committee. Um, this committee um, put forth recommendations for ecological reserve here on the island. And this one was at um, Sandy Cove, where we have a, the big restoration effort that's been going on that Louise talked about. And so here we have a public consultation. Uh, you can see Louise here in the background and some of uh, her students and some of the other government agencies. While at the front, we have local people. As a result of the, uh, the involvement of the local people, we have their participation in the establishment of the Provisional Ecological Reserve, which today I'm happy to say is a full-fledged ecological reserve. And we are currently working with uh, the recovery team to assist with uh, efforts to expand um, Sandy Cove Ecological Reserve and to um, expand uh, Watts Point and to see another one established at Cape Norman. We've also been working with enforcement people. Here we uh, help host a, an enforcement workshop, which included giving presentations and going out and doing site uh, business with these conservation officers, park rangers, and um, wardens to inform them about uh, the species and so that they could actually uh, go out and know where they were because some of these people were actually monitoring sites. We've been working with uh, various community groups and agencies regarding land use planning. And here we have a, um, a group up at Wild Bite so we have wildlife, uh, a wildlife manager here coming alongside to give uh, support and direction for trails in, in that area. And, and this one goes back again, Michael Brzezinski and Anne have been very, um, very supportive and they've given much volunteer work to uh, the Limestone Barons program. And here they were at Flowers Cove providing um, support with a trail there. This photo here depicts a management plan, a, a management um, group, which was developing a five-year plan for Cornishwa National Historic Site, of which we also were a part of, providing a direction as it related to the limestone barrens. So we've been out there involved in the community as a whole from uh, every level imaginable. Here we have uh, some of the local people out helping with the downloading of data from one of the climate stations. Um, here I'm meeting with uh, a local businessman and uh, a, um, a helicopter um, pilot, a pilot who's bringing supplies from the Labrador coast to the island of Newfoundland. But this runway is near a population of Brea. So we are consulting with him about that. We're marking out uh, where signage should be placed. And here are some of the signing. This is one of the signs that we've worked with wildlife on. And they are erected at very, uh, at many of the sites where long spray are found. We have put up species at risk displays at local airports in, and this was done in conjunction with the Canadian Wildlife Service. And we are currently working with tourism groups, um, local citizens, government agencies. Just recently uh, met with a group up at um, Flowers Cove that we are um, planning to 
uh, we are actually helping them with proposal writing and uh, plans for a big project in that area. Our hope is, and our plan is to develop a sustainable ecotourism best practices guidance document for the limestone barons in conjunction with these groups. And um, development of specific site um, storyboards, we're right at this time working with a, a group uh, town to develop a storyboard. And of course, site brochures and uh, planning an ecotourism workshop in the near future. These are some of the signs that have been erected at Portage National Historic Site um, some years back. And these have actually been provided as templates to local towns who have actually taken advantage of it. And uh, they have, uh, because each sign, each of these signs uh, depicts of the region and provides information about the plants, about the habitat, and about some of the work that's happening in other areas. One sign is site specific. So um, it's been very, this, these were developed by Parks Canada and um, it's been a, a, great, uh, a great plan from the start. And now we have these eco stops. <clears throat> This is a project that we worked on with the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, again, it came about as uh, a response to uh, a trail that was done by, local, by a local uh, group called Sabri, and we provided uh, support here as well. One thing that we've been doing is is recognizing our good stewards, uh, those volunteers who've been out there with us from the beginning. And um, uh, this uh, is something that's very important, I believe, to keep the momentum going and to, um, to show appreciation for those who are helping us. Um, so, in concluding, I, I would say that to be successful, species at risk recovery efforts must be a combination of research, community involvement, education, stewardship, and protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dulcie, and also thank you to um, uh, Louise as well. You might stop sharing your screen there, Dulcie, and we'll have a few questions. So that was great. I mean, um, it's lovely to hear um, from you both. And clearly, you're very passionate about your area and about its conservation. And I know you've both been working hard for many, many years to conserve the, the, the wonderful, I guess, biodiversity and, 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 and um, heritage of, of um, the limestone barrens. Uh, a few quick questions just on land ownership and land use. Are, is there any other land uses in the barns and who owns the limestone barns? I guess I can take that one. This has been a, a bugaboo for a long time because, of course, um, limestone barns are, you know, were, uh, uh, were basically fishing villages until they were connected by the highway. And so many times um, we don't know who actually owns them. Um, most of the time it's not private land and I noticed in one of the questions there was really really the only thing that happened there was uh, quarrying um, they used to um, dry their uh, nets on the limestone barrens because the fishermen's nets because most of them were fishermen or they would take the wood that they cut during the winter and dry it. So really there was no agriculture as such there. So in terms of land use, um, it's, it's really not, um, it, it's, it's more resource use rather than, uh, you know, having anything we've disrupt, disrupted. And of course there's a lot of people had their houses, like Dulcie said, you know, it's in their backyard. The houses are literally on the limestone there. Okay. Yeah. And do you have, um, do you have browsers? I know there's a lot of kind of woodland inland from there. So do you have deer and things like that, which maybe browse on, on some of the rare plants? Is that, is that an issue for you? 
Interesting. Somebody did say about what mammals would we see there. Yes. So we don't have deer on the island of Newfoundland. Um, we have caribou, which are used limestone barrens, especially in the north of the northern peninsula. A lot of uh, caribou. Uh, moose came, uh, were uh, brought in in the 1900s, um, and they are very very common now, but they tend to be more in the forest than on the limestone barrens. So occasionally you do see a moose every once in a while, but in the area I was talking about, I think we've seen a moose footprint once. Yeah. Okay. And just to elaborate on, on, on Terry's question, um, Louise, while you're, while you're speaking, what species of birds, reptiles, and mammals, and well, birds, reptiles, and other mammals would you find on the barrens? Right, so this is this has always been of interest because the limestone barrens are such a, a, a linear strip. There's really not a lot of, you know, birds and larger mammals that are found there. You know, they may wander in, but as uh, so like, so for example, we have short-eared owls um, that, uh, that nest on one of the small forest patches, but there's nothing really obvious that is so they would come and use them, especially in the flyway. So uh, one of our partners for one of our other big project works on a lot of shorebirds because we're right next to the shore. We actually do have a number and it's a part of a flyway that goes north. We actually do have in the spring, a lot of shorebirds um, like the red knot and all kinds of interesting things that we have people coming to look at. So it's more shorebirds rather than any kind of uh, forest birds or anything like that. Now, I, I will say we do have some interesting insects, but again, it's not like we haven't yet found one that is only found there, like we have with the plants, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Let's let's talk a little bit about the community that you mentioned, um, and you, you've shown some great photographs and really inspiring examples of community stewardship. And I think uh, that's some that's a model that we really try and advocate here in the Baron, like community ownership of the conservation agenda and community action toward it. What um, describe the community to me? Is it a fishing community? Is it economically fairly, um, um, I suppose, sustainable? Or are there tough times? I know for a lot of coastal fishing communities, there probably are. How do people make a living? What's your typical sort of community like up in the Barrens? Oh, okay, I can take that one. Um, we have a very senior population now because of the out migration in the early 90s. Most of, um, most of the people who work here are actually fishermen or they commute. So they go uh, across the country. They may go to British Columbia. So it's, it's from one coast to the other in Canada uh, into mines where they work um, gold mines and some of um, more um, where you have different uh, metals um, other than gold, of course, uh, ore mines. And uh, so these are mostly what we have now, uh, going to Alberta to the oil sands. This is what we have, what we're faced with currently. Um, there's a big segment of the population that we don't have here anymore. They've, um, in the 90s, when the mi out migration started, uh, uh, that age group that were graduating from high school then, they never came back. And, and that's been happening now for probably uh, almost two decades. Wow. And yeah, so, so how, how is that reflected Dulcie, in the school populations? Are they continuing to decline? Are schools shutting down or, or what's happening? Absolutely. Uh, it's a big decline. Let's, I, I, would, I haven't gotten most recent uh, stats, but a few years back, they were seeing like um, a decline of 50% in some schools. And some schools have actually had to close. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that add to the challenge? I guess it's often said here that you know, if 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 you know you know if if your numbers are declining, if the population is economically um, 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 challenged, and if there's very little indigenous industry, it makes possibly the whole conservation message that bit harder to, to sell because it's, it's possibly less of a priority. Would would you find that? I mean, 
Um, there seems to be very little indigenous industry, as, as you described. There's a, a lot of people have left the area, so quite an elderly population. Does that pose a challenge to your stewardship approach? It's interesting that you um, make that comment because lately I've been thinking uh, a lot about it and we're seeing like um, a different uh, mentality now, even within some of the towns when I go visit. Uh, previous um, mayors had a different attitude, but I know in one of the local towns now, um, it's a fisherman who's actually a mayor and his attitude toward um, the plants have, are so, it's like, it's so from one end of the, ex, one extreme to the other. Um, so there is like this gap and it just indicates why education has to be ongoing, why it's vital to get a buy-in from local people. Now within our schools, we're still seeing um, um, students interested. However, we've lost a year now of schooling and education. So we've got another gap there that needs to be addressed. Um, it's, I, stewardship is something that has to be constantly ongoing so that people have it before them that they're reminded. Uh, if not, somehow it seems that people have a tendency to forget quickly. And we're seeing a lot of um, ATV usage, again, snowmobiles. I didn't make reference to that because um, there were so many other things that I could have brought in uh, that we've been addressing. Um, yeah, so hmm. certainly it is impacting um, what we're doing. Uh, and just yeah, one other quick question. Sorry. I was just going to yeah. pop in and say one of the big things that I think Dulcie, you know, has been working hard on lately, while well, we all have, is the fact of trying to make this an ecotourism stop. So she mentioned that we are, and she's been working a lot with the town of Flowers Cove. They're putting in a big grant to try and make like a, a little hub for tourism, for people coming so we can train local people to be trail guides and things like that. So we are trying to make this more of a cultural um, as well as an ecological tourism thing. And, and just on that, I mean, there's, there's you mentioned before the Port is, is that a is that a Viking site in my recollection? Is that correct? No, no, you're thinking something further. Yeah, you're okay. So there are, there are cultural, there are a few culture sites that you mentioned um, in your talk, but um, is, is there is there is there many archaeological sites or historical sites of importance in the area? That's a very important uh, archaeolo archaeological site. Um, the earlier people that came to the island uh, would have la would have. Um, set up in Portishwa. So that's been a very important dig for many years. I think um, maybe the late 60s. Okay. And they do have a site there, uh, Parks Canada. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I'm going to hand back to Pranji in a moment, but um, thanks, Frank McGorty, for your question. It doesn't, uh, about um, agricultural practices, I assume there is very little actual farming on the barrens, but in, in the general vicinity, could you describe a little bit about some of the farming practices? Is there much food production in, in the area? Maybe not in the barrens, but adjacent to it. No. Not There's a short day. answer to that, and it's no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> people, people have... <laughs> and those, yeah, that, people, those that wonder about how you make a living farming in the barren, I think if they, were, <laughs> if they went to the limestone barrens, it'd be much harder, judging by the images. Um, no. Listen, thank, thank you both. Um, it was no, really interesting. Yeah. Sorry, Louise. Just said there's no cows or anything like that. Okay. There's really no farming. It's just small kitchen gardens that people have outside, yeah. mostly in the peat, to try and grow their own food. But no, absolutely no agriculture. Okay. Listen, it was a really interesting presentation. Just before I hand back to Prangeli, just to see that some of the common plants that we have, what you call the harebell, or the bluebell we call the harebell, and the gentian amarella and the mountain avens you mentioned as well. Um, I was very fortunate to visit um, the, the limestone barrens um, 10 or more years ago. And one thing maybe that um, is worth emphasizing about it, not just the interesting ecology and stewardship and historical sites, but the incredible 
level of, of hospitality in that area. I think there's a great connection between Ireland and Newfoundland and in that quite remote part of, of, of Newfoundland and up in the Barrens, there's just wonderful people who who just give you such a warm welcome. So if anybody if anybody's feeling adventurous post-COVID, I'd really recommend that they visit that part of the world. And it's great to hear from um, you both, Dulcie and Louise, that it's in such good hands. I know you've been doing this work for a long time, so congratulations, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, and I think we really appreciate it, even at this distance away from you. So thank you very much and um, for joining us. Over to you, Pranjali. Okay, thanks again, Brendan. Um, fantastic presentation, really enjoyed that and saw the parallels with us. Um, I hope that we can visit you someday. Maybe there is a, there's a flower festival like we do in, uh, in the Burn, Burn in Bloom. Uh, so we look forward to visiting you. So I can see there's, a, there's barely any time left. So I just want to remind everyone that this was the last um, session of our limestone landscape series, but we plan to introduce another series of webinars shortly, which is likely to be for members only. So if you're not a member, please consider supporting us by becoming a Burren View member. But also from tomorrow, we are starting um, our uh, annual uh, symposium called Learning Landscape Symposium. I'm gonna share the screen now. If those of you who aren't aware of it, um, please uh, look it up. There's lots of interesting talks coming up and they are starting from tomorrow. I'll post the link now. Um, so with that, I will say good night. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. much. I didn't post the link. I didn't post the link to everyone now.